All right, guys, looks like we're going to let Bob do some talking. I want to first thank you very, very much for being here today. So let's give Bob a big hand. Sometimes you go to a place and they say, well, give them a speech and leave a couple of minutes for Q&A. Sometimes I say, in, in order to do the show, I need to do the Q&A first so I know what you want. <laughs> and then we never get around to the show. <laughs> um, since a lot of you are here, and I'm selling in Phoenix, and I've theoretically met all of you, <laughs> got, and you've got my photograph, is there anybody here, honestly, who does not know who the heck I am? <laughs> no, seriously, is any, anybody came with a friend or something and said, you're going to talk, talk, talk to an old guy? Okay. No, I really want to know. Can anybody put their hands up who doesn't know anything about me? <laughs> Only one guy. Well, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, she, she, uh, she pointed you out, so if it's true, I'm sorry, I will not tell you who I am. <laughs> no, that makes things uh, much simpler. So, uh, just a very quick starter anyway. Seventy years ago, Walt hired me when I was 23 years old. That's 70 years ago, that's 1954. Anyway, years before that, Walt would take his daughters out on uh, Saturday and say, that's Daddy's Day. And he took Diane and Sharon out to these little amusement parks around the Los Angeles area. But he never found anything he'd call a clean amusement park. It just wasn't. So he had an idea in the late 1930s while he was sitting there shelling peanuts at the Griffith Park Mary Ground, which incidentally I rode in the same days, same place. And said, well, I'll make one myself someday. Well, the someday came about 1952. He took a couple of pieces of paper and put it in his typewriter and he wrote out, if I were ever build a park, here's what I want my park. So that was the start, 1952. He uh, formed a company at about that time called Wed Enterprises, W-E-D for Water Elias Disney, his father. So that meant oh, he's going to start a company. Here's the tricky part. He's the president of Walt Disney Productions in Burbank, California, a movie and television company. He's going to build an amusement park, and he's going to run it, and he's going to own the company that designs it. But he put people in a bunch of rooms scattered all over that lot in the studio, and these Walt Disney Productions stockholders did not know that. He got away with years of no rent paid for his company. <laughs> what was a smart businessman? But anyway, they, they caught him one day in 1961. So we all moved from Glendale, I mean from Burbank to Glendale. And then that was the sort of the official address, 1401 Glendale, some of you know that address. Of, uh, which by that time we would call it Imagineering. The name changed in later years to WDI, Walt Disney Imagineering. So that's kind of the start of the company and how it got to where it is today. It's a very, very large worldwide company called the Walt Disney Company today. It's around 300 companies of different sizes, all kind of buried into one another, almost an impossible thing to describe to anybody, I feel sorry for anybody who's trying to be the president of that company. It's, it's, it's almost impossible, just because you got some big major parts of the company, but a lot of people, I'm guessing a lot of you are more theme park interested, because some people, they're interested in the whole Disney company. Yeah, which one of the 300 is your favorite? And sometimes it's movies or it's products. A lot of times it's theme parks, and then specifically sometimes Disneyland, because that's Walt's original park. And then a lot of people already know all that, but they want to know more about Walt. So they read everything they can about Walt, and they're still curious, and they'll pay money 
to Mr. Porter to come in here <laughs> and get more <laughs> deeper, deeper, deeper into the weeds of questions about Walt Disney. That's the end of the speech right there. So the Q&A will now start and run, run to whenever. Well, either I get tired or you don't have any questions or he tells us to stop. So, that's what it is. so I will try my best to find the fastest hand in the room, which is called, it went up right now, see? <laughs> What's your question, sir? I love everything that you've built. I'm curious of your thoughts on the UFOs and kind of why that didn't work well, so many other ideas did. You ask about the UFO, which what you really mean is the flying saucer. Yes, sir. That's correct, okay. There was two versions of the flying saucer. The first one was uh, built in the 60s at Disneyland. It ran there for quite a number of years with a lot of trouble all the time because it needed a computer to control the airflow, the balance of the airflow for those little valves that they use, that the saucer run over the top of. Had we waited about 15, 20 years, we would have had computer controls that could handle the damper valves underneath the thing and handle the airflow better because this had great big uh, chambers underneath and it has uh, sonic movement. There's uh, shock waves, and those shock waves would sometimes be upset with little kids bouncing the uh, vehicle. And then all of a sudden, all the valves would open, and the trash would blow up, and it took maybe two hours to get that thing to reset again. So it was finally it was so troublesome they took it out. Now you're asking about the latest one, which came and went so fast. <laughs> Okay, uh, don't tell anybody about my answer here. <laughs> yeah, because you really want to dig deep, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay. About three years before that new attraction, Flying Saucers, called Luigi's Tires, was added to DCA. They had a test track in Glendale on top of a building so that nobody could see it. And we had to climb up there with a vertical ladder to do it. One day they invited me up there and said, well, we got it wrong. Why don't you come up and, and write it and see what you think? And I took one look at it, and I had some questions right off in my mind. <laughs> but I jumped in it, and I made that thing run so good and so fast and crash so hard into the end, into the end because I know how it works. Yeah, okay. So I started asking questions, and I says, why is the vehicle so big compared to the first one? And they said, our management told us to make it for two people because we can double the capacity. Okay. Did anybody ask you about the categories of people? We're still going to have little kids. Yes, we will have little kids. Are you going to have couples now that we're going to have two people in the vehicle? Yes, we are. Have you looked at the size of some of the couples that go to Disneyland? <laughs> 350 pounds times two is 700 pounds. The ratio of a 60-pound child to a 700-pound pair, they begin to wonder, why am I asking those questions? <laughs> you see, there's a difference between wishing you could do something Marty Scar said, if you can dream it, you can do it. Not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you have to deal with the gods of gravity and corrosion and physics and all that stuff. Which sometimes, it's kind of missed sometimes. And somebody says, we're starting this project and you are assigned and you are going to do it. But sometimes you don't get a chance to say, hey, bud, I got a question. And you try to explain about some physical reality, it might work or it might not work. The reason I'm saying that is because in Walt's day, Walt had sense enough to have a, a kind of a feeling for what somebody might be able to do. It was kind of an uncanny thing. He would ask people to do something they said they'd never done, well, they're going to do it anyway because I'm asking you to do it. That means you have people with quite a bit of imagination, quite a bit of curiosity, and you'd sometimes talk about one another. Do you think that thing would work? What if, what if we try this? What if we try that? In the more modern world, where everybody is trained and they are in different 
compartments of a company that say it's common that you would launch a program, and it's not just Disney, it's like everybody. Uh, and everybody says, well, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it, so I'll do what I'm told. And sometimes you forget to think and ask questions. You follow me? Yes, here? sir. Anyway, when I asked them a little bit further about this, and I said, the ratio of the weight of that vehicle, it goes up by the, the square in every dimension we're doing. How does the 60 pound kid tip it enough to make it move? Oh, I said, tell me about the 700 pounds or the air pressure that you're going to be using on this. Uh, that they save money by not using the valves. They were just going to have a 100% loss of air. Will it lift off the ground? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> they went ahead and built it. Uh, I kind of got my tongue in my cheek for a while. Then when it opened, I went down there. Now here's another curious thing. We used to have guests who would go to a park without a smartphone before it was invented. <laughs> you didn't stand at a line that has a wall full of instructions how to make this ride work. No, they're chattering and they're texting right and left, paying zero attention to the ride, zero attention to the instructions how to make it work. Then when they get out there, they jump on the first car they see, and it won't move because it's stuck or something. But a few smart ones like me, I pick out which car has the biggest run that I can get up to speed and hit somebody else. I run and I jump on the darn thing and we take off and I just do crashing like mad. And some people are sitting there and they all get off and they text, it don't work. <laughs> okay. Guests need to cooperate a bit with attractions but you know please pay attention you're going to have a very very good time you can text at any time so what i'm trying to illustrate is there's a difference in guest behavior over a period of 60 years due to increasing technology uh, and the reason i'm doing this a long question because you asked that there are some things about getting things to work in a technical world that sometimes sound good in words but when you get into it, maybe it doesn't work quite so good. In my particular case, Walt would hand me things to do with no further instruction, which meant I basically don't have anybody to talk to, and Walt didn't, wasn't specific. He said, Bobby, I just want you to get started on, and then you walk out of the room. True, he did that to almost everybody at Imagineering. That meant you need to stop and think, how would I do this? Do you think a thing like that will work? And then you go out and got a search on your own and try to find some answers and find some people who might know some things about the thing you're about to do that had never been done before. That was basically the way imaginary work in the Walt Disney days. And then it gradually morphed more into an organized company where you had to have licensed people to do things. And oh, by the way, the engineers that did Luigi's tires were licensed engineers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can be smart, make a smart crack about this because I'm not an engineer and I never went to engineering school, which gave me 100% freedom to draw anything, whether it might work or not, but I would only draw something that I, I felt I could go all the way to opening night and not have too much of a problem. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, long-winded question, but that will cover a lot of territory. The next hand goes up right here in the corner. I have a question. Uh, for somebody who wants to get into the now, what advice would you give them to make that dream a reality? Okay, in the uh, early 1990s, for about seven or eight years, uh, Imagineering had a, a program called Designer Enrichment. And they had uh, quite a wide range of uh, people, some of them already retired. They would come in on a regular basis, like uh, once a week, and it was all recorded on the VHS, uh, talking about the experiences of, of their period of time to enrich the young new designers now of uh, how some of the things work and how some of the things don't work. They stopped the program and never did a thing like that again. 
Oh, I'm not going to comment further. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a different world. People are a little bit more on their own and the way to figure this stuff out. And at the same time, the people work in great teams and have a lot of meetings. So there's a lot of chance to uh, have a lot of thought expended. Uh, when that thought is expended correctly, and you zip right along and you have a really, really great project. If you don't, sometimes it's a little harder. Uh, the little harder example, the final one I'll mention is rocket rods. <laughs> There was a perfectly good people who were removed for I don't know why it was removed. And it was replaced by a thing that ran for less than two years and was not there anymore. And the Wedway, today when somebody says, Bob, when's the Wedway coming back? And I says, well, it's right now the world's largest concrete leaf, leaf collector, but it's a good sunshade. <laughs> I did learn the reasons why it can't come back because I was in a, a D23 a special luncheon at uh, Imaginary a number of years ago, and I knew that question would come up. And the fellow who was in charge of that part of Imaginary was sitting right next to me at the head of the table. And that question came up, and I said, Speak, sir. <laughs> And the poor guy, he felt like I'd stabbed him in the back. But now he's got, he has, has to publicly answer it to people in need to agree. I did not know how there was that many reasons why it, it can never come back. I won't go into it, but there's a lot of things that change over time. Building and safety rules, uh, safety emergency access rules, stuff like that. Example, simple one. Vehicles are required to, uh, if they have a breakdown or a fire or something, you have to step up and have a walk away with a regulation handrail on both sides of the track. Well, that's a, that's a tough one to do. Okay. That's just an example. Yeah. Again, long winded answer. I kind of, uh, you know, but being the designer type, I would like to explain it thoroughly enough so you get it. And the next hand goes up right there. <laughs> Yes, I gotta be quick. Yeah. I'm 92. I try to be quick. I, I keep going, you know, okay. We're doing just. Uh, I'm gonna look in the back of the room next one. Okay. Well, your question, sir. What can you tell us about the story of how Kingdom of the Dinosaurs came to be? I thought we was talking about Disneyland, not that <laughs> not, not, not <laughs> Okay. Uh, did you get his question? Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Knott's Berry Farm is one of my favorite parts. I'd love to go there. It's quiet and kind of old-fashioned and nice. It had a, um, a, a, a building that had several shows in it, Knott's Berry Tales. Remember Knott's Berry Tales? That was Disney's Rolly Crump that did that one, along with his son, uh, Chris. It's a very cute show, and then, of course, it, its time was gone. They took it out, and then they wanted to do something about dinosaurs, which was very popular. And then it was followed in recent years by a um, kind of an interactive shooting gallery kind of thing. It was really cool. It worked really well. I was there on opening day of that and gave the opening day speech. So I do have a connection with Knott's Berry Farm in that respect. But what he's asking about, I can't comment on all the answers to the questions, but I told him a little earlier, Here's a funny thing. I was working with a company uh, called Sequoia Creed. We did King Kong, did all those big jobs. We did the Kingdom of the Dinosaurs, making the animals for the show. And somehow the designers of the show made a, a scale drawing of the show area. But when they made the drawings of the size of the animals, where they go, they accidentally doubled the size. <laughs> Not until we were delivering the first dinosaur, and it went in a room that was for a, like a 10-footer, it's a 20-footer. <laughs> and it was too late to do anything. It was so funny, the little kids would go in there, oh, I didn't know they were this big. Mommy, I, I don't want to go any further. <laughs> this was a fantastic mistake. The, the whole room was stuffed with dinosaur meat. It was just incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about the only thing I can comment that I actually know what the facts about. Okay. What was your most challenging 
I get that question all the time. The question was, that, what was my most uh, biggest challenge? Now seriously, I never saw anything as a challenge. Really, I'm not kidding you. Remember, I'm not educated in engineering, but I was educated in car body styling back in 1952. I have a free mind. I can just figure stuff out, because you have to figure stuff out. Remember, everything that Imagineering did had never been done. Number one, we start immediately, and there's nothing to research. Oh, that's a hard one. And then Walt would set the date of the opening on the day he set, started the project. <laughs> it's common today to open it when you finally get done years late. No, we didn't do that. <laughs> That meant you get to work immediately, and in my case, I would immediately see several ways to get started. So, so if it was a challenge, it would be, okay, which of four or five ways I might do something, which one looks the most likely that it could go the, the furthest the soonest, knowing that if I went up a dead canyon, I could back out and try another canyon to, to get there. And that was sort of the way that I've, I've always done stuff. Because one day I had a guy ask me a question. He says, um, uh, we want to make a movie and we're going to have a Godzilla in it. How much of the job can you do? And I said, I'll go from the first uh, sketch to the opening night of the movie. Boom, you got the job. Because if you see your way through all the paths that might be, you always want to make sure the major path that might give you the trouble, you can see ways to gradually get it there on what I would say is opening night. Now, if you have that mentality towards doing something, you never get yourself in trouble. And then you say, challenge. What do you need, challenge? I never had one. That's, that's the way it works. Well, from the Mark I to the Mark VII was 13 years. Okay. <laughs> oh, somebody's always going to ask about Octopia. Um, Walt had on his list a uh, bump car, because they were commonly called bump cars in the 20s and the 30s. But his was going to be a, a modern car on the freeway. It's not going to be a bump car, but guess what? We had bumpers on them anyway, and the kids were not supposed to bump them. They're still bumping. The sign said, don't bump the car ahead. And we have to hire people to stand on the track and go, no, 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 no. Yeah, but when he looks the other way, I bump the car ahead. So the car. All right. This means that I was hired by Walt to design a body for the little Autopia car. I was trained by Art Center College of Design to design styling of a body. But I'm not an engineer, but I'm a car guy anyway. I know what, I used to repair my own engines and stuff with 36 Fords and Model A in the auto shop, so I fully qualified, obviously. Um, Walt assumed if I did the body, I did the chassis. I didn't, but I said, Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Long story short, we built 40 cars. Three of them were going to be on the track. And at the end of the first week, only two of the 37 cars were winning. And the line was just as long. <laughs> this was probably the blackest period of my life, I think. What that did, that launched Along with all the other attractions that were having great difficulties, Walt had never built a park. We thought we knew what we were doing, and one by one we had a lot of failures that we had to solve immediately. So all of a sudden you had Imagineers and maintenance people, operations people that did that, slowly teaching ourselves what works and what doesn't. So if you visualize that first summer, we couldn't wait for school to start so we could shut down Monday and Tuesday and fix everything every week. All right. That means you had a nice long climb of improving the park. Everything about it very slowly over the years. So 
So by the time we get to about 1960, Disneyland had been purchased by Walt Disney Productions. It was an independent company up until that time. For people to look back in that period and say that, oh my gosh, you actually had to figure this whole thing out, every detail, as you went. We were overwhelmed with, with crowds. So we finally got up at that period, we had a, a pretty well-functioning park, and most of the parks, most of everything functions very, very good. Again, along with the story, because the techniques of how you have to teach yourself things. But we went through the Utopia cars, the Mark I, the two, the three, the four, the five, and the seven, before I finally got a car that would work. That's how long it takes when you ask that question. You have to keep making the improvement based upon the experience that the car experiences by little kids. One of the clues for you guys that understand car stuff, you always assume that you crash the weight of one car into one car that's standing still, that's like one G a car. Uh-uh. We have places where we have a hill where you've got a three to five kids pushing each other comes up to five cars that are stopped waiting to unload, you have a humongous bunch of forces that you can't even calculate. You have to kind of figure out what would stop a car from breaking. A little simple stuff like if you weld something together and you bound on it long enough, you're going to break some of it. Oh, why don't I make a chassis of a car that is not welded together it's clamped together with little elastomeric parts. You slam these cars, and everything flexes just a tiny bit, just like that, and it never breaks. The Mark 7 car was designed in 1958. They've changed bodies twice in those years. That's the same 1968 chassis because nobody wants to touch it because the basic guts of that car won't break. <laughs> That's another long way to story because it has to do with the time it takes to learn by experience what the public is going to do to just tear your park apart. And that's just the way it is. So the next question is going to be up in the front row. Right there. Following on that uh, description of the cars, I've seen there's some discussion about possibly doing like hybrid or EV vehicles for that topic. Do you think there's any information on that? Well, your question is so timely. Do any of you guys out there follow any automotive blogs? You know, like uh, like Autopian, uh, a couple others, you know, Autoblog, stuff like that. Anybody here read the Los Angeles Times? Ah, wait a minute, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, a guy a guy phoned me up uh, two weeks ago and said, uh, I'd like to ask you some questions about Utopia. He says, I'm a writer, my, my name is Sammy, and um, uh, my agenda is uh, getting a clean planet someday. So I'm interested in the technology of changes that must come by making a thing as green and healthy as possible, and then writing about your Utopia, which is the stinkiest place in Orange County. <laughs> Well, the guy latched into something that I've been arguing about for 24 years. Why on earth do you have a one-cylinder smelly gasoline car that bumps and bangs along on a rough track when we said it's tomorrow and that is not the tomorrow and I want to live in? <laughs> you see how times change like that. In any event, within two days, all these automotive uh, programs pick up the same story, because here's a weird thing. This guy was talking to me and he says, I just talked to a lady yesterday at the Disney company who was a spokesman, and she's a spokesperson, and then she says, uh, in answer to his question, she says, uh, yes, we have a roadmap to improving Autopia before 2030. Okay. It's all tied in with the story that Sammy wrote in the LA Times that everybody else picked up. Well, I tell you, there is a hornet's nest going on right now because several people know Autopia and Hong Kong from the get-go is electric. How many people know that? 
It's electric and it's silent. The track is smooth. I just reviewed a video the other day about it. Two nights ago, I was at a, a big party for Ryman Arts in Glendale, and Tim Delaney, the art director who was in charge of that project, said, we had a budget to do it with gasoline, and we figured out we want to make a green car from the get-go for, for Hong Kong, and we found a way to do it electrically to fit that budget without spending any more money. And the way it works, it's not a hybrid. This is an electrically propelled car with a smallish battery in the car that is recharged every time the car comes back to the station, it stops, and they're there just long enough with induction charging uh, in the track to the uh, induction receiver on the bottom of the car. It keeps that battery cycling up and down. It does that all day long. You don't charge a battery to make it run all day. You charge it every lap going around. That makes the most sense, so that, that means that's not a hybrid. That's an electric car with an intelligent way to put the electricity in it on a continuous basis. So um, I got my fingers crossed that so much push is going to be done uh, uh, about Disney, please, doing this. But at the same time, it looks at, why don't we redo Tomorrowland at the same time? On and on and on. Now that we've got a great big quandary of, oh my goodness, how do we do this? When are we going to do it? What all is going to be in, enclosed? And I'd say, tear it all down and make the most gorgeous, beautiful future that you ever want to live in. It's all inspirational. You take your little kids, they got a Topia car zipping in, in and out of shows on the inside that's interactive like radiator springs. I would think if I was five years old and I was 46 inches tall, that's the future I want to do. Woo! Yeah. End of speech. <laughs> okay, the next hand is going to go off over here. Oh, right there. <laughs> What was a project that I really enjoyed to do? And was, did I ever have an idea for a project that I never did? Okay, last question is, I'm not the guy who figures out what to do. I'm the guy that when you have an entrepreneur with an idea and money and some paper and some time, they don't get the first base. They get beautiful pictures painted, they get beautiful scripts, and they got a piece of property. They have to make that step. We're going to spend really expensive money and get people to design this, build that, engineer this, etc. And, oh, occasionally have a mechanical machinery. So I'm the guy that will make that step into expensive physical material reality from the original idea. So again, just to be clear, uh, I've never had an idea that didn't happen because I don't do that part of the idea. I do it once somebody says, what if we could do this? And I'll give you an example of what to do. Your question, many of you are, are not aware that I did about 100 jobs for the Disney company. And then I left and formed my own consultancy and I did 150 jobs for everybody else which most people don't ask about. So she just baited me really, really good. <laughs> I was president of the Gurr Design Company as a consultant, and I get jobs for all kinds of people. The entrepreneur has a crazy idea and phones up, say, hey, Bob, we're thinking of doing this. Oh, boy, I hope you do that, because that sounds really cuckoo. I'd like to go do that. Well, then we'll hire you to do it, just like that. Anyway, I heard about a job in Las Vegas, a guy named Steve Wynn, who had a hotel with a volcano in front of it. And the guy says, uh, I want to do a, a pirate battle show in front of my new treasure on the hotel. And I wondered, what sucker is going to get that one? That was, cause that was really crazy. Well, it turns out two other Disney guys who left, left Disney, the three of us went up and talked to him. And about a two hour talk, Steve Winnie gave us the job. That's the way business works outside of big companies. 
You have people that are an entrepreneur and they are fearless. And if they see a chance something might work, they will go for it. And the three of us took a look at look at it. We didn't see anything impossible about two two ships, eight seventeen hundreds, getting a big fight and one of them get, gets sunk and the captain goes down with it every three times a day. And it's on fire. You know? <laughs> it's got live stunt people. And it's got electrical cables underwater. And it's moving 180 feet on two different radius tracks. Well, that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Seriously, that job, I worked with about 22 different uh, contractor trades. Everybody cooperates with a master, uh, a master uh, corporation will do the job. We all work together. We have very few meetings. We just uh, want to know a question. We ask before the month set. Uh, I need some information about this, I need some information about that, and we're not going to wait for a meeting. Fine. That sounded like the way Walt Disney did stuff, which it really was. We didn't have the slightest difficulty building and testing those two ships. About $13 million job, and I'm, I'm sort of a lead mechanical designer on the thing. And it was fun the whole time. Getting everything to work just right, we didn't have anything that you call an impediment. But by golly, when I was there on the opening opening afternoon of that thing, I said, holy moly, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's a big show that's full of technical stuff that's terrifying, which you always put in the back lot behind the screen when it doesn't work. Steve Wynn puts it on a sidewalk in front of the building with no curtain. <laughs> Steve says it works every day, isn't it? Yes, yes, it'll work every day, Steve. Here you watch. And it did. And the joke was, here's the funny part. You'd see people approach the show while it's underway. Fire and smoke and explosions. Everybody's on the sidewalk. And the show's over. They have a hard time getting off the sidewalk. But there was a sidewalk going straight into the building. <laughs> the only way to get off the sidewalk was go into the casino and gamble. <laughs> The whole thing was a marketing trick. <laughs> Those are the jobs I love, that kind of stuff. And of course, the other ones was 30-foot tall animated King Kong in Universal Studios. That thing was there for 22 years. I did lighting for Michael Jackson, of all things, learning about their rock and roll stuff. Anybody remember the closing ceremonies of the Olympics in 1984 in Los Angeles? You can go on the internet today and see a 50-foot diamond flying saucer that came from Mars with no visible means of support. Scared the daylights out of people. That's a different job. That's a, that has to go through a 15-minute window without fail. It's broadcast worldwide. And I only had five weeks to do it. Oh. Yeah. So, the reason I smile, I have had a blast at, at doing crazy stuff for crazy people, starting with Walt. Okay, the next hand goes up on the right. Way over there, you got it, right there. Uh, what were your experiences working on great moments with Mr. Lincoln like? Because that's an animatronic versus, you know, riding vehicles. So how did that how does that different? Oh, that's the coolest question. That, that, that makes a big distinction between what you're used to doing and you're suddenly asked to do that you've never done. I had life drawing in arts Center college, but I'm not good at art drawing pictures of humans. I just don't quite get it. But Walt had been working on a uh, Lincoln for about a year in a secret room at the Walt Disney Production Studio. And they were out of time to uh, build these four attractions in New York World's Fair. Uh, the attraction building was already built, state of Illinois, and we were down to like October at 53, and we were going to open in April. And they did not have a working mechanical Lincoln. So I was called over to the studio with my boss and go talk to Walt about this thing, and I saw this machine that was kind of pathetic, and I found out the guys were behind the wall trying to get it to get up out of a chair. Now here's the difference. If you have an open mind and you're not trained to do stuff in a certain way, you can see something in a different light. 
I was in a glider club and I was restoring a World War II glider with little tiny thin welded tubes. I looked at this Lincoln and I saw, why isn't that thing a, a fuselage of an airplane? We can use little tiny aircraft parts, very precise, lightweight stuff. We can use a lot of lightweight servo valves, all this kind of stuff. So that launched that mechanical design in that direction by not seeing it as a heavy piece of machinery to get a man to get out of a chair. Okay, it's lightweight. We use airplane parts. <gasps> they have little tiny bearings that are really, really good that will last a long time. And we had to move at a very high speed and have a lot of faith that it was going to work. So as fast as I would draw it in you know, just 2D on pencil and paper, every time I finished the part, I'd give it to a draftsman to complete it, and I would take it every morning to the studio, and they would start building it with no assembly drawing. In other words, usually you get the whole thing engineered, and then you have approval to build it. You know, those kind of jobs, you start in and go as fast as you can without the total picture. But the total picture will show up eventually, just about the time you finish it. That is a method of a project that is, that is frightening to do something like that. And the doggone thing worked. And that launched us into doing production engineering for animated figures with a pirate ride. And you remember how many pirates were in that pirate ride? So one figure taught us how to do production figures, and we still use some of the same parts today that were engineered in the 60s based upon that one Lincoln. I worked in the Lincoln studio at the Ford Motor Company, so I worked on two Lincolns, one with the wheels, <laughs> one with the wheels, and one with the top hat. <laughs> okay, right there, sir. Go ahead. So since you were on the other side of the road, what was your experience day one when the rope dropped? When the rope dropped? Day one. Okay. Before day one was uh, a media day. So there's two, remember, Disney had had two days. Day one when the crowd came in. Like when that rope dropped, when the first person came in with the first ticket, what was that, what was that experience on your side of the road? Okay, you're talking about the second day. Okay, rope drop day. We were so exhausted. <laughs> After the media day, that we all drove home and went, ah. We came dragging back in to find so many broken things. So the rope dropped in certain cases. Quite a few Utopia cars did not live the first day. We had crocodiles from the Jungle Cruise that were already loaded on the trucks and were on their way back to the studio to repair them. That was not a good day. But we did the parade twice, so the media day and did the, the, the official first rope drop day, which was on the 18th of the month. And I, was, I drove Autopia cars, and we had nine of them uh, in both parades. I, I barely can not forget the opening of the media day. I was so exhausted, I really can't tell you much about rope drop day except we are in trouble. <laughs> I never had that question before. So that was, that was it. Okay, on this side of the room, way in the back. Just a second. I do have to. You never know what's in the bottle. You know? <laughs> Disney magic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any question about anything that I didn't do for Disney? Okay. Huh, here's a good test. This is a good one. Other than, other than the, uh, we already touched a little bit about the Knott's Ferry Farm. Does anybody who really knows my history really deep know anything about something I did that was not Disney? Jurassic Park. See, the question is self-answering. There, are, remember, the 100 jobs Disney, 150, and none of you know anything about it. So any question in that area is a question I'd love to have. 
Do you have it? I was working with at Jurassic Park to make the T-Rex. The dinosaur. Oh, Jurassic Park. Okay, that's, that's a good one. I got a call one day from Steven Spielberg when I was down at Universal getting ready to open Universal's Park in uh, around ni late uh, 91. And um, he says, uh, I says, how soon are you coming back to uh, uh, Burbank? I'd like to talk to you. So I go talk to him and he says, I just bought a book. It's really thick. It's, it's, I want you to read it. And I said, oh, that's a telephone director. He says, it's okay. It's, um, uh, who's the author of Jurassic Park? Michael, Michael Crichton. Crichton. And he says, I says, Bob, it's only printed one side. You don't go twice as fast as you read it. It was a, it was a galley proof of Jurassic Park, which I still have. <gasps> So I settled down to, for a five five months with Steven Spielberg, figuring out how they're going to do a big movie. Because Steven only does stuff. He works with um, uh, the studio out in the out in the San Fernando Valley, Stan Winston Studio, and he only deals with guys in monkey in monkey suits for dinosaurs, and he wants a sixty foot tall, hydraulically driven actor and he says i saw you build the king kong i know those things work and everybody says don't do it and it's not going to work and steven says i saw it work and he says can you come help me figure that thing out so to be able to work with a guy like spielberg who is extremely flexible uh if you say no to him he says well let's try to find another way and that is so well busy you you never say no you always say oh i'll find another way so Louis Steeble goes through things. You just keep digging your way round and round all of the uh, the impediments, and just keep on right going. So I made sure Stan Winston Studio hired two of my guys that helped build King Kong. Because if we learn something off King Kong, why can't Stephen have that? And then Stan Winston can pick it up too. So that's the ends and out how those those kind of jobs go. Um, they, they built, Stan Winston built this great big thing and uh, it worked beautiful except one night one part broke because the script did not call for flooding with that much water. The doggone thing gained about 400 pounds of water and <laughs> overloaded the part. And the problem with a movie, do you know how expensive they are per hour? And to stop for 30 minutes to change a bearing? That's a lot of money. See, if the theme park, it could break and it could take weeks to fix it. On the movie, uh -uh, you don't do that. So that, that poor dinosaur ran and it only stopped for 30 minutes and it went right through the movie. The good part about working on movies, it's junk when the movie's done and you chop it up, throw it away. So it doesn't have to last long. It just has to last really good for about a month. So I love I love making movie stuff. I did Godzilla also in the same way. Yeah. So those are fun. Long winded answer. Oh boy, there's a good one. I'm assuming you mean the first monorail. The first one? Right? The Mark One monorail, Disneyland? I designed four of them. Which one would you like to hear? <laughs> Okay, I'll assume you need the first first monorail, the number one monorail? Yes, Disneyland, okay. I told you earlier the way Walt works, he establishes the opening day on the day he tells you we're gonna get started. This was one of my all time favorite jobs because you, how many of you have seen the picture of the monorail crossing? That, that little sketch, took about 10 minutes to figure out what this train needs to look like. About 10 minutes on a sketch of, at my kitchen table. A couple of days later, I came into the, my office and drew the picture. Backing up just a little bit, Walt had been looking for a monorail since 1952, and he accidentally found a monorail in Germany. He and his wife were taking a vacation. He's on a road near Cologne, Germany, and just as he drives along in this little forest, a monorail goes right across the road, right in front of him. Two seconds, one way or the other, Walt would never have seen that monorail. He backed up, went in and 
talked to some Germans who didn't speak too much English, but he got just enough information about the company. And yeah, they make, they're making monorails. So immediately, within days, he sent uh, teams of um, executives from Disney to Cologne and negotiate a deal that uh, we're going to build monorails together. So with it, so Walt came back and he showed me pictures of this German train, which uh, some monorails, they look like a loaf of bread with a slot at the bottom sitting on a stick. They're not very elegant. And then Walt says, Bobby, I, uh, we're not going to use that German design. He says, I want you to get started on ours right away. And he walks out of the room. <laughs> Do you know how frightening that would be to, <laughs> to a trained engineer? Since I'm not, I had a pencil and a white piece of paper, and I could go in the direction I want. You have no idea what design freedom is unless you're in that kind of a situation. I was so excited, I just saw what that train needed to hide the slot in the bottom of a loaf of bread. That was the number one question right there. I read Buck Rogers, 1938-39, Dr. Zarko riding the rocket ship, had the little fins down the side when they land on the planet. Anybody old enough to remember Buck Rogers? No, you gotta be 110, I think. <laughs> Anyway, that was the clue. The shape of that pointy rocket with those little sled runners meant the monorail is a very tall machine. What if I curved it and then curved it out and made the fins the color of the beam as close as possible? Your eye would only see a, th a thinner type of car. But what if it's nice and pointy you will not see the slot, but it's there. You will see the whole feeling of the shape of the front end of that thing. And the back end can be the same. With that in mind, I took all the dimensions we had of the size of the beam way that was going to be used, figure out with the turn radius, which is only 118 feet, how the, how the basic shape of dimensions that car will be. So I started making a couple of sketches that after I made the sketches, after Walt came back and looked at the picture and tapped it, and he said, Bobby, can you build that? And I just said, yes. And he walked away again. <laughs> now, we're, now we are really stuck. But here's another thing. If you're not trained and you're a hot rider in Southern California, you're very aware of race cars, how they're built, what kind of shops build stuff. You're very aware of trucks and all kinds of rolling equipment. Number one, don't invent anything that's basic like an engineer would. They're very proud. I didn't need to be proud. I needed to find a bunch of stuff I could buy right away and, and make it into a monorail. You need tires? Okay, we can get wheels. Okay, I need an axle off of a truck. Oh, well, we have drag suits, so we use a big differential. We narrow it down and we got to Oh, well, we just chop up a rear axle. Now I got a drive shaft, and the company's purchasing department said, Oh, electrical. It's 600 volt stuff. There's, it's streetcars of 1935. They're, they're in the junkyards. We can buy this stuff. We bought junk <laughs> trolley car parts <laughs> and, and eight, eight electric motors. We got them for like 100 bucks a piece. And then you take all the functions, junk and figure out what you can combine with modifying it, and then you build the basic structure and then bolt the store-bought or the junkyard stuff together. Really, that's the way you get stuff done fast. Never invent expensive stuff. Get something that already runs. Eight and one half months from the time Walt said, Bobby, get started, I gave he and his friend Richard Nixon, the vice president of the United States, his wife and the two girls, I gave them a ride. Eight and a half months. You can't get a budget for a job in eight and a half months out of a big company. <laughs> Seriously, that, I'm glad you asked me about that because that was an example of how people can fly at a very fast speed. I'll go a little further to explain it. The closest company that would build that train was a garbage truck company in East LA. 
halfway through the time, they were too slow, and Disney took the job out of the garbage truck company, put it in a vacant movie studio building in Burbank, and we finished it there, and then shipped it to Disneyland and installed it. So there's different ways you have to do stuff. You want to be completely flexible about it. So that was one job that was a big business lesson for everyone involved in that whole job. And the training wasn't very good, but it, but it worked in enough years that we saw all the things that could be better. So then um, we made the Mark III monorail, which was there for a great number of years. And then from that, I made the Mark IV, which is for Walt Disney World. And then the Mark Disneyland's current train is a modified body of a Mark III from 68 with a brand new chassis that's, uh, that's heavier type of equipment but with a real good looking cool body on it. It's always got a Mickey Mouse wrap or something on it. So that's a long winded story, but thanks for that. That's, that's a favorite. Way in the back over there. Yes, ma'am. No, I was always assigned to what I was assigned to and aware of all the other cool projects going on and the one I did miss was Pirates. I would really love to work on Pirates, but that was the one that... Uh, I was committed uh, for a number of years. The monorail member was... The ticket the Mark III blended into the Mark IV, so I had about seven years of nothing but monorail. In the meantime, all the other jobs uh, came and went. So, yeah, I can't work on everything. <laughs> <laughs> but I got all the cool ones with the wheels. Yes. Way over here. Now. There you go. Yeah, so um, my question to you is what inspired you to leave the Walt Disney Company to go out and start your own company? Um, and on top of that, you mentioned before the business person at Walt was. Was there anything that you learned from Walt that you brought into your own company when you made that transition? Okay, you're making the transition from working for Disney and having my own company. Yes. Disney fired me. <laughs> Remember, I told you I'm not an engineer. Somewhere in the mid 70s, the company uh, had, you know, changed to a bigger, more complex organization, and everybody had to be fully qualified for their job. And I was informed one day that, uh, I'm sorry, you cannot design anything anymore, but we will give you a job as the clerk of the uh, drafters designing um, uh, Epcot. Serious, seriously. So that was a couple of years not very good, but I understood the question because they would only hire licensed designers to design mechanical equipment. So I was no longer qualified. It didn't matter that all my stuff worked. <laughs> I got called into an office one day after a meeting where I accidentally insulted the chief engineer of Wet Enterprises, and uh, he took offense and um, basically said that um, we wish you to seek a career in another company. Oh. On my way home, I bought a book, How to Incorporate Yourself, <laughs> And they give you two weeks to leave. On day 13, I was the president of the newly formed California 1244 Stock Corporation, and I hired myself, so I did seek a job <laughs> in a new corporation. I just wanted to build a company. <laughs> and I had clients lined up. Wow. Don't ever feel sad about something happening that you didn't intend, because it might be a gold bucket full of roses just around the corner, which it turned out to be. Okay. Oh boy, here we go. Someone's going to ask about cars. Okay. I hope this is okay. Um, five years old, I was enamored with cars and airplanes. I'm still enamored with cars and airplanes. I'll answer, answer the car part. I always was excited as a little kid. I saw a car, I didn't know what it was. Sometimes I'd grab my mother and run down to, uh, to the corner 
street where there was a brand new car like a like a 1938 Nash which had a leaning forward grill. Some of you guys might know that car. I was so excited. I had my mother has to save its car. So I was always looking at new cars. I always wanted to be a car designer. Um, I wound up going to Art Center and I got a job in Detroit. But in two weeks I could see it was a dead end job. So I turned around and came back to California and two years later, Walt calls. So well, that part of the car thing was going to be professional, but it never, it never turned out. The joke is, I designed four more cool-looking vehicles for Disney than I ever would have or ever stayed in Detroit. So there's one of those reverses that turns out to be the gold bucket full of the roses, you see. But to be specifically on cars, I loved uh, overhauling engines. Uh, I had a Model A Ford, did that one, that did change the body on it. I had a 36 Ford 5 window. Uh, I did uh, work on that car, and then I had a Rolls Royce uh, older car, a Rolls Royce for 30 years. I overhauled the engine in the Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, I had a lot of hands-on experience, but at the same time, I had some cool cars. Does anybody know what a 1961 Citroen Maserati SM is? Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> One of you guys, you better get on the smartphone and look it up right now. Citroen Maserati SM 19, 1961. It is the coolest, sexiest looking car I ever saw. And they bought the very first one sold to the west of the Mississippi. I had some other cars, the little, you know, the little C car, the 240Z, I had one of those. And I had a Ferrari. Everybody in life, if you're lucky, needs to have one red Ferrari. V12, three tri triple, double choke Weber carburetors on it. Uh, yes, I had a lot of cool cars. I just love those cars. But don't ask me about airplanes. Well, this meeting will last all the way to tomorrow. <laughs> okay, way over. Oh, there you go, right there, sir. The first time I rode the Manor, yeah. uh, it was before the it was before the track was finished. <laughs> uh, we got enough of it built that we get it outside the main structure, so that uh, then we just kind of finish the end of the water drop and all that stuff. So uh, a day came and we put hay bales at the end of the track, and we started testing the vehicles with uh, we put sandbags in the cars. Uh, there's one car to uh, try it out, see how it's going to work. And it looked pretty good. It did just what it was supposed to do. And then my boss was there with me. And um, I had my little boy with me. And uh, my boss says quietly, Robert, you designed it. You ride it. <laughs> I jumped in with my little boy. They took the sandbags out. The car came right back and stopped at the, uh, the hay bales. And then I found out later, several guys said, we got to go right where we want and pull the hay bales away. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been okay anyway, but that was, that was quite an experience because I don't like roller coaster, but I would ask to design a track. Um, and yeah, it worked. It still works. It's the roughest, the most terrible track in the world. And I, I just, I don't want to ride it anymore. <laughs> Oh, no, the lady yes. Did you design the unibuggies from animation? Yes, I designed the, uh, the dual buggies. Um, that is called, a machine It's called the omnimover. You know, it moves in all directions and it moves people. How many know that the uh, haunted mansion was not the first use of the omnimover? Ah, uh, sir. Yes, sir, the voyage to inner space was the inauguration of what in the second version was called the Doom Buggy. It's the same machine exactly. One had blue cars and one had uh, black, black cars. That's the only difference. Uh, so yes, that's the answer. I did design that. Okay. Okay, way in the back, way out there. What was the average day with Walt like? Oh, that's very good. So many people want to know about Walt Disney. 
On one hand, you kind of sense he's the special God in a way. But on the other side of it, you have to talk to him every day. <laughs> no, this, this is how most people have felt. On one hand, you wanted to know him better, but he's never going to be your buddy. But you're talking to him every day. How many times do you have an experience when you talk to somebody that's quite, somebody that you really always wanted to be, and you get kind of close to him, but there's a kind of a fatal distance, you're too close, you go, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, what do I do? <laughs> and that has to do with a little distance, maybe it's two feet, three feet, something like that. Walt had that effect on people. So there was this little unspoken distance, a little bit different for everybody, that if you were close to him to have a casual conversation, but not, not an inch closer, the other side of it would be is he spoke in regular terms. His choice of food was regular. He liked hot dogs and spam. <laughs> his tastes were very simple. His taste in words were very simple. He never used any highfalutin words. He never I never saw him at any time on airs, if you know what I mean, people put on airs. He was as regular a guy as you could ever get. But part of you said he's a god, the other part said he's special, but I gotta work with him every day. And people became comfortable with it. Because I saw him several times, and he would note that people are nervous. And he would do stuff deliberately, uh, to let somebody calm down a little bit. And one time he said to somebody, he says, just calm down. Uh, to do this thing, we've got to talk. And then that, somebody would calm down. And then you'd, after a while, you'd get used to when uh, Walt was around, either you were going to have a meeting, maybe, which is rare. But most of the time, he walked around the studio all the time. Everybody had to leave their door open because he would show up at any second. He never, he almost never had an agenda where we're doing something on a certain day with a bunch of people. He wandered around in that studio a lot. Also, he wandered around at 1401. Now, think of this. An ordinary MBA trained executive of any organization depends upon the layers of people that you are in charge of. Down in the bottom part is usually where the product is being made or painted or welded together or something. And that is where the problems are in any organization. Some of you guys that work in companies or even run a small company, you know that's where it's like. If you follow the rules and you go down to your executives to inquire about something that's not right, it will be filtered automatically by the people that are asking the questions further down. And once that question is learned, it won't be truthfully told because you won't, don't want to hide the things. You want to hide the things that are not right. So you come back up to the filters and you get your answer in about three weeks, which is too late. Walt had sense enough, business sense, if he's got an income, something's not right. He, he walks over and looks. And he could look at any moment, come into anybody's room, in the shops. He was always out in the back lot. And everybody was used to that. It was common to see Walt wandering all over the place. But guess what? Walt was the very first guy to catch something that was not going in the direction that he thought we ought to go. OK, now, but you're not in trouble. Walt would walk up to somebody, uh, whether it's an artist or a welder or somebody out in a, a wood shop, and say um, casually, he said, say, uh, did you ever think of, and he'd have an idea. That's not me. He's asking you, did you have an idea? He's not telling you that thing sucks, and if you keep doing it that way, I'm going to fire you, like a lot of executives do. You never want to speak down to a creative person because they will become less and less creative. 
and then pretty soon you have a country full of vegetables in meetings because they're terrified of being caught doing something wrong. Walt knew that. Walt could say, did you ever think of, and almost always his idea was better than yours. And you'd go, oh my God, I missed that. See what you just did? He has asked you to continue to, to contribute on the way to get stuff to work really, really good, not by telling somebody they did something wrong. That's a very, that's a very interesting thing for an executive to do. And a lot of people told me they says nobody works like that anymore. And of course, that was like 30 years ago. And I says I had two clients: Steven Spielberg, Stephen Wynn. Same guys, same MO as Walt. You want to know what's going on? Call them up. You want to know further what's going on? Go over and take a look. That's a big lesson for anybody in an organization. Again, long-winded answer, but Walt was such a unique person to be around because what happened was most of the time he is so successful at a new idea, his batting average was so good that you'd have a new employee come in and says, oh, this is terrifying. Nobody's going to get away with this thing. But after a while, it worked. Now you had a whole organization. The batting average was so good that when he asked you to do something, you thought, oh my god, I can't do that. Well, let's try. Because his, his chance of being successful is so good. Now you have a whole organization that behaves just like that. I could talk forever about Walt, but thanks for asking that question. Okay, we're going to go way. Up. Okay, the first book uh, is called Design Just for Fun. Is that the one you're asking about? Yeah. Okay, that's the one you can't get. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I had people forever saying, Bob, you should write a book. Yeah, 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 I'm too busy. I'm never going to get around to it. One, one day, people pin me down and says, you should write a book. So anyway, if anybody remembers Doobie Mosley with um, a, little, a little company called Laughing Place, they started in Burbank, then they moved to Florida. And the guy approaches me one day and he says, You're, you are going to write a column for our blog. I'm not a writer. I can't even spell. I can't even type. I've never learned to type. He says, well, do it anyway. So that got me started. And then a few years later, it was like, you go better do your book. So I talked to a lady friend of mine who makes books. And I says, hey, I think I could do a book. She says, well, I'm not going to do it for you. You're going to do it yourself. I'll show you how to do a book. I'm a publisher. I found out, don't ever be an author, be a publisher. The publisher makes all the money. <laughs> okay, so I worked my for myself. I thought at fifty-eight ninety-five for a book by an amateur is hardbound, about that thick. Oh, I was taking a chance. All the books sold so fast, I told everybody it's going to be the red book, the blue book, no more. And I said, buy it right now. I love to go on eBay and find sometimes uh, one person wanted twelve hundred dollars for that book. Average is about six hundred if they're beat up a little bit. And I thought I missed the chance to make all the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, it was it was interesting doing a book like that. And then a few years ago, I thought you know you could do a book on Amazon. There's nobody home at Amazon. It's all an app. You click into the app. Follow the instruction. You can design and build and write a book all, all, at, your, all at your own risk. Uh, and you can sell books. Funny thing is, Amazon won't print that book anymore because it uses the word Disney in the book. They're so scared of Disney. They said, you need a letter from the Disney company authorizing us to resume printing your book because you mentioned the word Disney in it. But I own the copyright of the, of the only two images in the whole doggone book. I go to Disney and I talk to the copyright division and said, since you have no copyright material, we can't authorize you to print your book. So it's a catch-22. It goes round and round the circle. But in the meantime, Disney says nothing when, Di when Amazon sells the Kindle version. I get revenue every month from Amazon for a book that 
We can't print what they do anyway. Maybe I'll get the print again someday. Huh? My boss says the show is over after the next two questions. <laughs> oh, Parker Cole here. <laughs> All right, okay. I want somebody that's going to add, I'll take you. That's, that's the next to last question. As a guest. Uh, I love Islands of Adventure. Secondly, I can't <laughs> wait to go to Icon. How many of you are following Universal Icon? Yep. Ooh, you watch out for next year. You're going to see the most astounding part that is, that is coming along in recent years. It's an old-fashioned park full of eye candy and disbelief. Universal has so many storms. They got even got a Frankenstein land. Ooh. Please go on YouTube and uh, click in uh, Universal Icon and take a look. Every week, they, they have new updates every week following this monstrous job in Florida. That's a real cool one. Um, yes, I like Universal. The reason I did a lot of design for them was they're small, and they're fast-moving, and they're fearless. Remember, that's the company that decided we want to spend $7 million, build a great big building, and have a 30-foot tall King Kong with, crashing, with a crashing helicopter, a tipping bridge, and a gorilla's mouth that's ready to bite you. Okay, so that's, that's the relationship there. And the last question is going to go to way in the back. I do have a, If I do this, it goes faster. <laughs> uh, I never gave a thought to a tattoo, but a couple of years ago, I was on a, um, a Virgin uh, Voyages ship uh, out of Barcelona, and they had the cutest little tattoo shop, the nicest people, super high, uh, high technology. Um, didn't hurt a bit. New technology, don't, you don't have any for it. But I, people kept saying, oh, come on, Bob. You gotta, you're old enough to have a tattoo. And I said, I asked him, I says, I'm going to be 100 someday. Will your tattoo last? <laughs> and he said, of course. Yeah. So, so I drew a picture of the monorail, and they, and they did it. But, I found out even before I got off the ship, I was getting people inquiring from the United States. You didn't get a tattoo. How'd you know? The tattoo company was delighted to have a Bob Gurk and then they could tattoo this old man and it went on the internet within hours. <laughs> from a ship at sea. Thank you very much. We had a great time. Oh, yeah, great time. Thank you so much, Bob. Big round of applause for Bob. Thank you guys.